Abraham experienced it and his name was changed. Sarah experienced it and she got laughter. Moses experienced it and he went from hiding to leading. David experienced it and became God's beloved. Elijah experienced it and brought down fire. A savior has come to you. A healer has come to you. A deliverer has come to you. A redeemer has come to you. You will not miss your miracle. Now, it's your time. Experience the supernatural in this month's Global Crusade themed The Glorious Visitation of Christ happening live in Ghana. God is ready to move. Also featuring our ministers, church workers, and professional conference team enabling grace and power for the end time harvest. The youth aren't left behind as they are moving upward to higher heights with the Impact Academy. Join us from the 28th to 25th of April at Independence Square, Osu, Accra. The word of power would be broadcast worldwide through satellite, radio, TV, and the GCK social media platforms. We will be blessed by glorious music from choirs around the world. And Bagada people said, yeah. I welcome every one of you in Jesus' name. Yeah. Wonderful to be in Shuluyi here. This is my first time of being here. And what a wonderful place we have over here in Bagada. And I pray that the Bible study tonight will enrich every life in Jesus' name. Amen. Those who are outside, can you give me a good amen? amen. The Lord enrich every life in Jesus' name. we we'll close our eyes as we pray together. Father, we thank you tonight. We we'll bless your name. We we'll glorify you because we know you are mighty God. And we know that you're omnipotent, you're omnipresent, and you're omniscient, and you're revealing your mind to every one of us today. We're asking, oh Lord, that all our ignorance will take away in Jesus' name. Amen. We pray that darkness will vanish away. Amen. Light will come, and the knowledge of the truth will enrich every life. And we pray that through the light that comes, everything negative, everything depressing, everything oppressive, everything of Satan will be wiped away in Jesus' name. We pray, oh Lord, that you touch every life. Turn us around for the better. We will be who you want us to be. We'll do what you want us to do. We'll go where you want us to go. And your word will have a positive, practical, powerful impact in every life in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Thank you very much. We're coming to John chapter 5. As we look at John chapter 5 tonight, we're starting from verse 17. John chapter 5, verse 17. But Jesus answered them, My father walketh hitherto, and I work. A simple statement, a direct statement, and a true statement. What Jesus Christ said unto the people. They thought they knew the Father, God in heaven, our creator. They thought they knew the Father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. They thought they knew the Father. But now as Jesus Christ spoke, and he said, My Father, referring to God in heaven, My Father walketh hitherto, and I work. They couldn't understand that. How could he link himself with God? How could he associate himself with God? How could he so relate with God like that and say, My Father and I will keep walking? Look at verse 18. Therefore, the Jews sought the more to kill him because he has not only broken the Sabbath, but said also that God was his father, making himself equal with God. You're going to find that there had been promised in the Old Testament, actually the last book of the Old Testament, that the son of righteousness will come and shine. We're looking at Malachi chapter, uh, chapter 4. Malachi chapter 4, and here we're reading from uh, verse 1 and verse 2. Malachi chapter 4, I'm reading from verses 1 and 2. It says, For behold, the day cometh, 
that shall burn as an oven, and all the proud, yea, and all that do wickedly shall be stubble, and the day that cometh shall burn them up, says the Lord of hosts, and it shall leave them neither root nor branch. Look at verse 2 now. But unto, th unto you that fear my name shall the son of righteousness arise with healing in his wings. And you see that son, capital S, is referring to the Lord Jesus Christ. The Jews should have been expecting the coming of the Lord. And the sun will shine in its brightness. It says, the sun of righteousness shall arise with healing in his wings. And, it shall, and ye shall go forth and grow up as calves of the, of the storm. And so you understand that the sun was shining brighter than it ever did in any generation since the creation of the world. But the Jews themselves shot themselves out, out of the light that came, out of the sun that was shining, because they remained in darkness, the darkness of religion and the darkness of tradition. Jesus Christ brought healing. He brought deliverance. He brought miracles. He brought work that no other man had ever done. As we look at the works of Jesus Christ, even in John, that is from John chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter 3, and chapter 4, and then coming to chapter 5, you'll know that he did much more than Moses had done, much more than Elijah had done, much more than Joshua had done. The sun was shining brighter than it ever did, and all the same they couldn't see. That's what Jesus told them in chapter 15 of John. John chapter 15, I'm reading from verse 24. John 15, 24, it tells us in 15 verse 24, it says, if I had not done among them the works which none other man did, they had not had seen, but now have they both seen and hated both me and my father. It says, I came to them. I've done miracles that no other man did. I've done healing that no other man did. I've worked wonders that no other man worked. And yet, it said, they will not receive. The attitude of the Jews uh, actually showed their ignorance and it showed their darkness and it showed their resistance to the truth of the word of God. But you ask yourself, I ask myself, we're asking ourselves, that attitude, that action, was that normal? Was that expected? Or were they inexcusable in what they did and how they responded? Let's look at John and let John tell us their attitude was inexcusable. Their actions were inexcusable and their seeming ignorance was inexcusable because they should have recognized the Jews in particular that this is the Christ. This is the anointed one. This is the one that came as the son of righteousness to shine before them. We're coming to John chapter 3 and verses 1 and 2. John chapter 3 verses 1 and 2. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus a ruler of the Jews. Look at what he said. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, that means master, that means teacher, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. Here was Nicodemus, one of the Jews, telling Jesus, he said, it's not only that I know, it's not only that some of us know, we all know that a teacher come from God because no man could have done these miracles you are doing uh, except God be with him. Come to chapter 5. We're looking at chapter 5 uh, and we're looking at verse 10. The Jews therefore said unto him uh, that was killed, it is the Sabbath day. It is not lawful for thee to carry thy bed. You know the problem here? It was a Sabbath day, their Sabbath day. And they then uh, uh, the Lord Jesus Christ had raised up this man. He had been sick for 38 years, impotent for 38 years, and invalid for 38 years. And Jesus with power came and raised him up. And instead of looking at the good work Christ had done, instead of looking at the shining sun of righteousness with healing in his wings, all they could look at was their tradition 
All they could look at was the religion. And he said it wasn't right for him to take up his bed. We're coming to chapter 6 and verse 41. Chapter 6, verse 41. Then the Jews murmured at him because he said, I am the bread which came down from heaven. That shouldn't have surprised them. When he said, I am the bread that come that came from heaven. After all, look at the five loaves and look at the two pieces of fish. And look at how he fed 5,000 men without counting women and children. And look at what he said. He said, I bring life to you because it is bread that gives you physical life. But I brought spiritual life, eternal life unto you. And I came from heaven. And that's what Nicodemus said. He said, well, you only know you're a teacher. Come from God. And God is in heaven. But their eyes were blindfolded. They couldn't see because they didn't want to see. I pray you'll not be like that. Having eyes to see, couldn't see. Having minds to think, they couldn't think. Having hearts to believe and to understand. They couldn't believe. They couldn't understand. Chapter 7, I'm looking at verse 13. Chapter 7, verse 13. It says, How be it no man speak openly of him for the fear of the Jews. That means the people actually knew. They knew that this or the truth is the way, the truth and the life. He came from heaven. He came to bless them. But because of the Jews, they will not confess him. Now, about the midst of the feast, Jesus went up into the temple and taught. And the Jews marveled, saying, How noise this man let us, having uh, never learned. They saw the words, they heard the words, they saw the miracles, they saw the wonders, and yet they will not totally yield themselves to the Lord. We're coming to chapter 9. Chapter 9, I'm reading from verse 22. John chapter 9, reading from verse 22. It says in verse 22, these words speak his parents, that is the parents of the man that was born blind. And Jesus Christ had given him his sight. He had seen. And the parents knew that Jesus Christ had performed a wonder, a miracle that no man, no other man ever did. But instead of saying, yes, that's our son, and as he was born blind, and Jesus Christ, the Jesus of Nazareth, the Christ, he healed him. He opened his eyes. Instead of that, they said, well, it's our son. As to how he got healed, you can ask him, it's of age. We do not know. That's why it says this was big experience because they feared the Jews. For the Jews had agreed already that if any man did confess that he was Christ, he should be put out of the synagogue. If anybody will say, yes, that's the Christ, we know him, we believe him, then they'll put him out of the synagogue. You can see their blindness, you can see their determination that although the truth was there, they were not going to accept the truth. They were not going to believe the truth. They were not going to live by the truth. Chapter 10, I'm reading from verse 24 chapter 10 verse 24 then came the jews round about him and said unto him how long dost thou make cause to doubt if thou be the christ tell us plainly these people have been wondering in their minds is this the christ is it not the christ if thou be the christ tell us plainly jesus answered them i told you and ye believed not the works that I do in my father's name, they bear witness of me. And he had told them right now that I told you I'm the Christ. I told you I'm the one. I told you I came from the father. I told you I'm the bread come from heaven. We're coming to chapter 11, verse 45. Chapter 11. We're reading from verse 45. It tells us in verse 45, Then many of the Jews which came to Mary and had seen the things which Jesus did, believed on him. There were people that were sincere. There were people that eventually became fearless and they said, we're going to believe on him. After all, when that Christ comes, will he do more miracles than this man had done? But some of them went their ways to the Pharisees and they told that what things Jesus had done. Look at verse 47. Then gathered the chief priests and the Pharisees a council and said, what do we? For this man doeth many, tell me, 
miracles. They knew this man does many miracles. And ha now, this is the reservation. Look at the 48. If we let him thus alone, all men will believe on him. And the Romans shall come and take away both our place and our nation. We're coming to chapter 12. I'm reading from verse 9. Chapter 12, verse 9. Much people of the Jews therefore knew that she was there, and they came not for Jesus' sake only, but that they might see Lazarus also, whom he had raised from the dead. Now, notice something here now as I'm going to read from verse 10. You see the blindness of the Jews. Their determination. They didn't want the light. Their determination. They didn't want salvation. They didn't want the conversion of their souls. And they locked the gates of heaven against themselves. It tells us in verse 10, but the chief priests consulted that they might put, tell me, also to what? To death. Why? Because that by reason of him, many of the Jews went away and believed on Jesus. You can see the blindness. And you can see the rigidity. And you can see the religion. And you can see the tradition. How that tradition so blindfolded them that they knew that Lazarus had been dead for four days. And by the time Jesus Christ got there, it was already stinking. And Jesus came forth in the power of the Lord and said, Lazarus, come forth. And the dead man who had been dead for four days came forth. And then he was totally made whole. And when the Jews saw that, some of them said, well, what else are we waiting for? This is the Christ. And this is the very Son of God. And they believed on him. But their leaders... Terrible leaders. They're leaders, religious leaders. They're leaders, blindfolded leaders. They're leaders that do not want the truth to get to the people. They say there's something we're going to do because of this Lazarus. Many people are going to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ because of that. We're going to even kill that Lazarus. You know that they didn't actually want the truth. The evidence of Christ's divinity was there. The evidence of Christ's sovereignty was there. The evidence of Christ's supreme Messi was so clear, but they deliberately closed their eyes that they might not see. I pray you'll not be like that. The people that say, here I was born, even though I see that the light is there, the truth is over there, but because this is where I was born, I'm not going to go there. I will prefer to go to the other side. I pray you'll, make, you'll not make that wrong choice. The choice that leads to hell, that leads to damnation, that leads to perdition because you are protecting something that has been abolished and something that will not take you to heaven and something that will not take you to favor with God. You are trying to protect that. I pray God will open your eyes and then you come out of that rigid religion and rigid tradition and rigid lifestyle that takes nobody anywhere. Look at what he did. Matthew chapter 13. I'm reading from verse 15. Matthew chapter 13. And I'm reading here from verse 15. Matthew 13 verse 15. For these people's heart is wax gross. And their ears are dull of hearing. And their eyes they have closed. Are you there in the Bible? Their eyes, they have closed. Have you seen that? Can you read that aloud with me? One, two, three, go. And their eyes, they have closed. Who closed their eyes? I said, who closed their eyes? Was it God that closed their eyes? How could God close their eyes? He wanted them to see the light. He wanted them to see the son of righteousness. He wanted them to see the way of salvation. He wanted them to have eternal life. He wanted them to get out of dark darkness and come to the light. He wanted them to get to heaven. And he showed them the light. And the light was shining brighter than any other light, any gospel light ever shone. The light was shining brighter than the time of Moses, brighter than the time of Aaron 
on and brighter than the time of Abraham. And as the light was shining in the bright noonday of the gospel, and Jesus brought the power of heaven to bear upon them, they said, no, I don't want to see, I don't want to see. And he closed their eyes. There are many people like that. They don't want to be convinced. They know that this is the truth. This is logical. This is powerful. This is practical. This is convincing. This is the way that leads to life eternal. But then they said, but it's my religion. But this is where I am. But this is where I am. But this is where I am. And because of that, they closed their eyes that they might not see. I hope there's nobody like that, like that there tonight. I say you are not like that tonight. You want to open your eyes and see. You want to understand. You want to see that this is the way. Walk ye therein. And whatever will shield the light from you, whatever you will block your mind, whatever will block your intelligence and understanding, I pray the Lord will break it and roll it away today from your life in Jesus' name. Look at that for verse 15 again. For this people's heart is what grows. And their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes they have closed, lest at any time they should see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and should understand with their heart, and should be, what's the word? They were not converted because they closed their eyes, they closed their minds, they closed their heart. They blocked their intelligence from the word of God, from the proper understanding. And Jesus said they did that less, they should be converted, and lest I should heal them. I pray God will open your eyes. And you will see Jesus at work in Jesus' name. Tonight, we're looking at this passage of scripture, John chapter 5, from verse 17 to verse 29, the authority and oneness of Christ with God. We have God the Father, God the Son, the authority of God the Son, and the oneness of God the Son, where God the Father, the authority and the oneness of Christ with God. The three things we're looking at, number one, the relationship between the Son and the Father. The relationship between the Son and the Father. Number two, the recognition of our Savior in his fullness. You see him at work. You see him as he shows the light. You see him as he revealed the Father. You see him as he opens the scriptures. And you recognize our Savior in his fullness. Point number three, the resurrection of saints and sinners in the future. There's a coming resurrection. And it's in the future. There is that coming resurrection, both of the just and of the unjust. The resurrection of saints and sinners in the future. Point number one. Tell me number one over there. The relationship between the son and the father. We're coming to John chapter 5. And I'm reading from verse 17. John chapter 5, verse 17. But Jesus answered them, My father walketh hitherto, and I walk. Therefore the Jews sought the more to kill him. Because he not only had broken the Sabbath, but said also that God was his father, making himself equal with God. They understood the language of Jesus. They interpreted it well. They said, he said, I'm the son of God. He said, my father is walking. I'm also walking. My father has walked either to, and I continue the work that my father have started. The same power my father manifested, I can manifest that power. And the same vision and the same goal my father had, I have the same goal. And the same intelligence that my father supplied, I have that same thing. And the same characteristics of my father, that's what I have. They said, you're making yourself equal with God. And then he goes on to say in verse 19, then, say, then answered Jesus and said unto them, verily, verily, I say unto you, the son can do nothing of himself, but what he seeth the father do. He seeth the father 
doing this, and then he's able to do the same thing. He doesn't do anything by himself. What the father started, he continues. And what the father plans, he, he proclaims and he performs. And what the father wants accomplished, he accomplishes that thing. What the father aims at, and the goal the father has, and the project the father has, and the intention the father has, he continues with that, and he does that. And he says, it's what he said the father do, that he does. And then he says, for what things soever he doeth, these also doeth the son. Likewise, for the father loveth the son, and showeth him all things that himself doeth. And I will show him greater works than these that ye may marvel. Give me a good amen there. Amen. We're talking about the father and the son. We're talking about Christ and the Almighty God. We're talking about our Savior and the Sovereign God in heaven. We're talking about our Redeemer and our Creator. That the Father and the Son are inseparable. God and Christ are inseparable. Our Redeemer and our Creator are inseparable. In nature and in attributes, they are inseparable. In authority and in power, they are inseparable. In eternality, that is, living from all eternity and infinity, the measureless, immeasurable power, they are the same. In authority and sovereignty, the Son and the Father are inseparable. Also in omnipotence, inseparable. In omnipresence, inseparable. Those, those are the characteristics of the Almighty God in His omniscience that He knows all things. They are inseparable in power and ability. Also in divinity and equality. That is, when you think about Jesus, He is God. He has deity. He has divinity. And He says, as my Father has that characteristic, I also have that characteristic in glory and in majesty. The Father Father and the Son are the same. The Father and the Son, God and Jesus Christ, they have the same glory and the same majesty in exaltation and honor. He's highly exalted and is honored. He who honors the Father must honor the Son. He who honors the Son must honor the Father. In word, the same. In work, the same. In wisdom, the same. In performance, the same. In perfection, the same. The Father and the Son are inseparable. There is, number one, oneness. There's number two, sameness. There's number three, absolute likeness. As uh, Jesus Christ spoke about, this, about himself, the Son, and he spoke about the Father, uh, you can see very clearly the oneness, the sameness, and the likeness. We're looking at John chapter 1, and I'm reading from verse 18. John chapter 1, I'm reading from verse 18. It says, no man has seen God at any time. The only big Gotten son, which is in uh, the bosom of the father, he has declared him the son, the father, the son, the father. And you'll see the, that they are inseparable. And you'll see as he talks about the father, he talks about himself. I'm looking at chapter 3, John chapter 3, and we're reading from verse 35. John chapter 3, verse 35. It tells us the father loveth the son and has given all things into his son. See the beauty of that. See the glory of that. And see the sufficiency of that. That the Father, Almighty God in heaven, a creator, that he loved the Son. And because he loved the Son, he has committed virtually everything into the Son's hands. I'm coming to chapter 8 and we're looking at verse 28. Chapter 8 and we're looking at verse 28. It tells us in verse 28, Then said Jesus unto them, when ye have lifted up the Son of Man, then shall ye know that I am He. There's no other person is unique. There's no other person is a savior. There's no other person is a lord. There's no other person is a redeemer. There's no other person is the anointed Christ. It's the one that has been prophesied from the old covenant and now he has come and he appeared before the people. He said when I am lifted up, he's talking about the cross, he's talking about his, about his death, he's talking about his sacrifice, he's going to sacrifice his life for the redemption of the world and he says when well, you have lifted up the Son of Man, then shall you know that I am He. He is. 
I said he is. And it's not like him. And that I do nothing of myself. Look at this. But as my father has taught me. As my father has taught me. I speak these things. He that sent me. Is with me. The father has not left me alone. For I do. How? When? For I do always those things that please him. And so you understand then the position of Christ, the authority of Christ, the nearness of Christ, and the oneness of Christ with the heavenly Father, the authority that he manifested. And then even the testimony that the Father bore about him, that this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. We're coming to chapter 10, John chapter 10 i'm reading from verse 25 john chapter 10 verse 25 jesus answered them i told you and ye believe not the works that i do in my father's name they bear witness of me verse 30 and look at this one verse 30 open your bible that is chapter 10 verse 30 if you are there say yes i'm there one, two, three, go. We're going to read together. Can you read that? One, two, three, go. Say that again. Say that for the final time. He said, there's no difference. I and my father, I what? He walks, I walk. He's perfect, I'm perfect. He's spotless, I'm spotless. He's eternal, I'm eternal. He's infinite, I am infinite. It's the one that can raise the dead. I can raise the dead. He creates, I create. He saves and I save. He's able to do all things and I'm able to do all things. Nothing shall be impossible with him. Nothing shall be impossible with me. I and my father are one. Sameness. Oneness. Likeness. That is completely and absolutely entirely like the father. I'm coming to chapter 12, John chapter 12, we're looking at verse 49, John chapter 12, we're reading from verse 49, for I have not spoken of myself, look at that, he said, I don't act independently. I don't act separate from my father. I do what he wants me to do. I do what I see him do. He says, for I have not spoken of myself, but the father which sent me, he gave me a commandment, what I should say and what I should speak. And I know that his commandment is life everlasting. Whatsoever I say, therefore, even as the father sent me, said unto me, so I speak. We're looking at chapter 14, verse 9. Chapter 14, we're reading from verse 9. As you look at all these scriptures, and you look at all the statement that Jesus made, even though the Pharisees did not like that, and the chief priests did not like that, and the Jews, some of them did not like that, but it was the truth. And he was bearing witness to the truth. And I pray that you will believe the truth in Jesus' name. We're looking at chapter 14, verse 9. Chapter 14, verse 9, Jesus saith unto to him have, uh, have i been so long with you and yet hast thou not known me philip he that has seen me has seen uh, the father that's final he that has seen me has seen uh, the father anything you want to know about the father he said look at me you've seen the father any attribute you want to know any character you want to discover any uh, attribute you want to uh, learn any skill you want to learn anything you want to say about the heavenly father just look at me he that has seen me has seen the father how seest thou then shows the father look at verse 10 believest thou not that i am in the father and the father in me the words that i speak unto you i speak not of myself but the father that dwelleth in me he doeth the works and i pray that god will give us understanding i will believe what he has said in jesus name now we've been hearing the son talking about himself and the father let's hear the father himself now talk about himself and the son we're coming to matthew chapter 3 matthew chapter 3 
And I'm reading from verse 13. Matthew chapter 3, verse 13. Then cometh Jesus from Galilee to Jordan, unto John, to be baptized of him. But John forbade him, saying, I have need to be baptized of thee, and comest thou to me. And Jesus answering, saith unto him, Suffer it, permit it, allow it, let it be like that. Suffer it to be so now, for thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he suffered him. That means he permitted. That means he let it go. Let it be like that. And then we're told in verse 16. And Jesus, when he was baptized, he went up straight way out of the water. And lo, the heavens opened unto him. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a low, like a dove and lightning upon him. And a voice from heaven. Whose voice is that? I said, whose voice is this? That's the voice of God. That's the Father. He had been talking about, I and my Father are one. I do the things that please the Father. I walk in the ways of my Father. I see what my Father is doing, and I do the same. Now the Father is going to talk about his only begotten Son. And lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son. Tell me. In whom I am well pleased. Look up here for a moment. In whom I am well pleased. If you are not well pleased with Jesus, you are not well pleased in what pleases the Father. And if you say, I know God, and you are not well pleased with Jesus Christ, you are deviating from him. You are going away from him. You are walking contrary to him. He says, this is my beloved son. I love him. I appreciate him. I recognize him. He and I are one. There's sameness. There's likeness. There's oneness. If you then come out and you say, no, I'm opposed to that, you're opposed to God. You're opposed to the Father. You allow religion to separate you. Religion is to bring you near to God. Religion is supposed to link you with God. Religion is supposed to make you agree with God. But now God says, that's my beloved son. And I've given him to be the anointed one. And to be the savior and to be the redeemer and you allow your own interpretation of religion to divide you from the father i pray god will deliver you yeah. the lord will set you free yeah. because when he sets you free you'll be like the father we're looking at matthew chapter 17 matthew chapter 17 i'm reading here from verse 1 matthew chapter 17 verse 1 and after six days jesus taketh peter james and john his brother and, uh, and bringeth them up into a high mountain apart and was transfigured before them and his face did shine as the sun and his image white as the light and behold there appeared unto them moses and Elias talking with him. And they, then answered Peter and said unto Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If thou wilt, let us make here three tabernacles, one for thee and one for Moses and one for Elias. While he yet spake, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them. And behold, a voice out of the cloud which said, tell me, On the Mount of Transfiguration, here the Father spoke again and said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Tell me the rest. Hear ye him. Hear ye him. And I pray that your heart will not reject him. Your mind will not reject him. Your tradition will not push you to reject him. Your religion will not make you to reject him. Hear ye him. We're coming to Second Peter chapter 1. 2 Peter chapter 1. We're reading from verse 16 and verse 17. Peter is now going to give us his testimony. He could recall. He could tell what happened on the Mount of Transfiguration. He tells us in Second Peter chapter 1 verse 16. For we have not followed cunningly devised fables when we made known unto you the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus. Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For he received from God the Father honor and glory when there came a voice to him from the excellent glory. 
This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. We understand then that Jesus Christ and the Father, they're one. They're united. And it says, I and my Father are one. If you really believed in God, look at what will happen. Matthew chapter 11, verse 27. Matthew chapter 11. I'm reading here from verse 27. You say, yes, I believe in God. If you believed in God, he's going to do something for you. He will reveal Jesus to you. Other people say, I believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. All right, if you believe in Jesus, he'll reveal the Father unto you. It's both ways. It's a two-way traffic. In Matthew chapter 11, verse 27, all things are delivered unto me of my Father. And no man knoweth the Son but the Father. No man knows the Son, but the Father. Neither knoweth any man the Father, save the Son. And he to whomsoever the Son will reveal him. You know what? If you don't believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, you cannot know God the Father. Because it's Jesus Christ who reveals the Father unto you. Who reveals the Almighty God unto you. And it is the Almighty God on the other hand that reveals the Lord Jesus Christ unto you as the all-sufficient one. As a savior, as a redeemer, as a healer, as a deliverer. The more you know the Father, the more you'll know the Son. The more you know the Son, the more you'll know the Father. Because the Father will reveal the Son unto you. And the Son will reveal the Father unto you. We've gone through point number one. The relationship between the Son and the Father. We're coming to point number two now. Point number two. The recognition of our Savior in his fullness. We're coming to John chapter 5. John chapter 5, and I'm reading from verse 21. John chapter 5, we're reading from verse 21. In John chapter 5, verse 21, see what the Lord is telling us here, verse 21. John chapter 5. What verse? It says, For as the Father raiseth up the dead, and quickness them, even so the Son quickness whom he will. He still continues with the fact that I and my Father are one. We have the same power, we have the same glory, we have the same honor, we have the same majesty, we have the same knowledge, we have the same omnipotence, we have the same eternality. We have, all, we have been from eternal and we have the same infinitude, infinite power, unlimited power. And it says, for the Father raises up the dead and quickness them, even so the Son quickness whom he will. Look at verse 22. For the Father judges no man, but has committed all judgment unto the son that's terrible for the people that do not want to believe in the lord jesus christ that's terrible for the jews the jews that said they didn't want jesus that's terrible for these jews that persecuted jesus christ it's the final authority is the final judge. And every one of those Jews, the Jews then, the Jews now, the Jews in all generations, they're going to appear before the Lord Jesus Christ. And he is the final judge. And those who are saying, no, we just believe in God, we have nothing to do with Jesus, God has committed all judgment into his hand. Other people said, we believe in Moses. We don't believe in Jesus. Moses is not going to judge you on that final day. Other people say, we're following in Abraham. Abraham is not going to judge you on that final day. Other people say, we are for David. We are for the, we are for the children of David. David is not going to judge you on the final day. The father has committed all judgment into his son. And therefore then, if you want to be free on that final day of condemnation and free of damnation, and you want to be totally released from punishment eternal, you have to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And thank God today, who Whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Everyone can be saved today. Because he doesn't make any discrimination. It's not partial. Anyone who will call. Anyone who will say, I didn't know that before. But now I know. And now that I know, I believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. He'll take all your sins away. 
He'll take your condemnation away. He's merciful and compassionate and loving. And once you call upon him, he will say, look at verse 23, that all men shall honor the son, even as they honor the father. Think about that. All men should honor the son, even as they honor the father. He that honoreth not the son, honoreth not the father which has sent him. You need to think through on what you are reading because these are very serious words. Sometimes you meet people that will say, you know, talk about Jesus, talk about our Savior, talk about our Lord. They say, well, uh, please, I don't want to get you any argument. I just, you can't believe what you believe, but you know what? We're all going to the same place. You believe in Jesus? I don't believe in Jesus. I believe in God. And since I believe in God, he is a creator. And then they begin to tell the titles of the almighty God. He can do this. He can do that. He can, I, I'm not an atheist. I believe in God. The only difference between you and I is that you believe in Jesus. I don't believe in Job, but I believe in God. And we're going to end up the same place. Uh-uh. We're not going to end up the same place. I said we're not going to help, not end up the same place because it says, he that does not honor the son does not honor the father. And you cannot pretend to say, I believe in the father, I believe in the creator, I believe in God, only I don't believe in Jesus. Look at that verse 23 again, that all men should honor the son, even as they honor the father. He that honoreth not the son, honoreth not the father, which has sent him. That was the problem of the Jews. Those Jews, they said they honored God. They said God was their father. And they had sacrifices. A father gave us, the heavenly father gave us all these sacrifices. And they observed the Sabbath. And they observed the feast. And they observed fasting. They observed a lot of things. The only thing with them is they will not honor the Lord Jesus Christ. They even called him a devil. They said he was mad. They said he was a sinner. And yet they felt they'll be all right on the final day. They could belittle Jesus. They could uh, have uh, derogatory remarks on Jesus. They could trample on Jesus. They could persecute Jesus. They could push Jesus away. But they believed in God. That's what they thought. But Jesus said, you don't honor the son. You're not honoring the father. And if you're not trying the father or the son on the final day, you're going to be on the other side. I pray you'll not be on the other side. Amen. You will honor the son. How do you honor the son? You accept the son. You believe the son. You obey the son. You bow your knee to the son. You pay homage to, you worship the son. You say, he is my Lord. He is my redeemer. I accept him. I believe him. You honor the son and you honor the father. Look at verse 24. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me has everlasting life. That's the only way to have everlasting life. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and to live eternally with the almighty God you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ you accept his word you turn away from your sin and you look at the death he died for you on the cross of Calvary and you say he's my savior that sacrifice was for me the blood is shed that's for my forgiveness that's for my redemption and that eternal life will be yours in Jesus name and shall not call me to condemnation but is past from death unto life. Passed from death unto life. I want you to come to Acts of the Apostles, chapter 10, verse 42. Acts chapter 10, verse 42. He said something there. He said, the Father has committed all judgment into his son. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 10, verse 42. And he commanded us to preach unto the people and to testify that it is he which was ordained of God to be the judge of the quick and the dead. He had been ordained of God, appointed of God, anointed of God. And there's no other person that has that authority or that prerogative. It's only in the hands of Jesus that he has been appointed to be the judge of the quick and the dead. We're coming to Acts of the Apostles chapter 17. Acts chapter 17, and I'm reading from verse 13. 
Acts chapter 17, we're looking at verse 30 and verse 31. And the times of this ignorance, God went out, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. And what the Lord is saying is, what you are hearing to do, I didn't know that before. I didn't think of that before. I didn't know I was dishonoring the son before. I didn't know that I was rigid in religion before. I didn't know I was blind before. He said now, all the times of ignorance is wanting to overlook. If you will repent today, if you will say today, now that I know the truth, I'm turning myself completely, wholeheartedly unto the truth, the Lord will receive you. He'll forgive the past. He'll forget the past. He'll block out the past. He'll say, now that you have turned and you have come unto me, I accept you. But if not, look at this, because in verse 31, verse 31, because he has appointed a day in the which he will, tell me, judge the world in righteousness. Do you know there are people that behave as if there's no reckoning day, as if there's no judgment? They drink whatever they want to drink, no judgment. They smoke whatever they want to smoke, no judgment. They are wicked, no judgment. They steal, there's no, they don't think there's judgment. They commit adultery, fornication, they don't think there's judgment. They even kill, they don't think there's judgment. They are wicked, they are violent, they don't think there's judgment. They oppress, they ill treat other people. They don't think there's judgment. They walk in darkness. They follow Satan. They don't think there's judgment. But there is a judgment day. That judgment day is coming. All will be there. But it's only those who have turned to the Lord and they have repented of their sins and they have called upon him to be their savior and their Lord. They are the people that will be free from the judgment of that day. Look at that verse 31. Because he has appointed a day. He has appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he has ordained, whereof he has given assurance unto all men, in that he raised him from the dead. He said, that's my appointed one. That's my anointed one. And he is going to be the one that will judge on that final day. We're coming to your first uh, Timothy chapter 1, First Timothy chapter 1, remember what Jesus said? He said, you honor the father, you must honor the son. You honor the son, you honor the father. If you do not honor the son, you are not honoring the father, and the honor you think you are giving to the father is not acceptable because Christ has honor. He has majesty. He has glory. And you need to recognize that the recognition of our Savior in his fullness. First Timothy chapter 1 verse 17. First Timothy chapter 1 verse 17. It says, now unto the king eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God, be honor and glory forever and ever Amen. And then we come to chapter 6, verse 16. Chapter 6, verse 16. Who only has immortality, dwelling in the light which no man can approach unto, can approach unto, to whom no man has seen, nor can see, to whom be honor and power everlasting. Amen. Amen. And now we're coming to, that's the Father, that's the Heavenly Father. He has glory, he has honor, he has majesty, and then he has that eternally. Let's come now to Jesus Christ. We're looking at Revelation chapter 4. Revelation chapter 4, we're reading from verse 11. Revelation chapter 4, verse 11. Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory. Tell me what follows. And honor and power for thou was created all things for thy pleasure they are and were created we're coming to chapter five chapter five i'm reading from verse uh, uh, from verse uh, 11 and behold and i beheld and i had the voice of many angels round about the throne and the beast and the elders and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands saying with a loud voice, worthy is, worthy is, who is that talking about? Jesus Christ. Worthy is the lamb that was slain to receive power 
and riches and wisdom and strength. Wonderful. Somebody shout wonderful. Worthy is the lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing and every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea and all that are in them had I seen blessing and honor and glory and power be unto him that seateth upon the throne and unto the Lamb forever and ever. Amen. Amen. And so you understand then that we give glory to the Father and we give glory to the Son. We give honor to the Father and we give honor to the Son. You honor the Father, you honor the Son. And you glorify the Son you glorify the Father. But he tells us, let me remind you, John chapter 5, verse 24. John chapter 5, reading from verse 24. Verily, verily, I say unto thee, that means assuredly, without any shadow of doubt, certainly, certainly, I say unto you, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation but is passed from death unto life. You believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, then uh, there'll be no condemnation. There'll be eternal life, eternal justification. And the Lord will say, all your sins that you have committed in the past, everything is forgiven, everything is forgotten because you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. It will be wise for you to do that if you have not yet done that. If you have done that already, you'll never leave him and you'll never forsake him. And until we see him face to face, you'll keep on believing on him in Jesus' name. We're coming to John chapter 3 verse 18. John chapter 3 verse 18. He that believeth on him is not condemned. But he that believeth not is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. He that believeth on the Son of God is not condemned. There'll be no condemnation. There'll be no damnation. There'll be no eternal punishment once you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Look at verse 36. He that believeth on the Son has everlasting life. I have everlasting life. I said I have everlasting life. Have you believed on the Lord Jesus Christ? You see your Savior? You see your Lord? And you're not going to separate from him? Whatever happens, you know, people don't understand. They might try to make fun of you uh -uh, or whatever. But are you going to keep on believing whatever happens? That's how you have eternal life and you retain that eternal life. That's why it says in that verse, he that believeth on the Son has everlasting life. He that believeth not on the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. We're coming back to John chapter 5. John chapter 5, and I'm reading from verse 21. John chapter 5, verse 21. For as the Father raises, raises up the dead and quickness them, even so the Son quickness whom he will. Why am I repeating this verse? I want you to look at this verse. This is not talking about a future time. This is talking about now. Look at the verse again. As the Father raises up the dead, raising the dead, he does it now. What does that mean? He quickens the dead. He resurrects the dead. He gives life to the dead. He says that the father does that and he quickens them. Even so, the son quickens whom he will. There are many people that, don't, that do not understand the import of that verse. The understanding of that verse. Because they are so limited in their understanding. But Jesus Christ is saying the father raises the dead. He quickens the dead. He resurrects the dead. What does that mean? There are people who are spiritually dead. God raises them. Matthew chapter 8, 
Matthew chapter 8, I'm reading from verse 22. Matthew chapter 8, verse 22. But Jesus said unto him, follow me, and let the dead bury they are dead. It's talking about two kinds of deaths there. There are those who are physically dead. There are those who are walking about, but they're spiritually dead. And Jesus said, let those who are spiritually dead, and they cannot do anything uh, spiritual, anything uh, alive, anything related with our life, they can't do anything more. Let those who are spiritually dead go and bury those who are physically dead. But you know what? The father quickness the dead and the son quickness the dead. If you're spiritually dead, he can quicken you today. Amen. Can make your spirit, your soul to come alive. He'll do it in Jesus' name. Yes. Uh, there are those who are dead in sin. You know what that means? They are deadened by sin. Sin deadens their mind. Sin deadens their understanding. Sin deadens their focus in life. Sin deadens their sensitivity. They don't have any feeling anymore. Those people who are dead in sin is able to quicken them, able to resurrect them, able to raise them up. Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. I'm reading here from verse 1. And you will see quickened, you will see quickened who are dead in trespasses and sins. This is not talking about final resurrection. Day. This one is talking about those who are alive today. But they are dead in sin. And sin has deadened their conscience. Sin has deadened their ears. Sin has deadened their sensitivity. But now they come to God and God by his resurrection power in Christ raises them up and they're quickened. Not only that, number three, there are those who are dead in sensuality. Sensuality, the works of the flesh, the defilement of the world, the festivities of the world. The worldliness and the entertainment of the world, they are totally dead in those things. I'm looking at First Timothy chapter 5, verse 6. First Timothy chapter 5, verse 6. It says, But she that liveth in pleasure is dead while she liveth. Living in pleasure, living in sensuality, living in immorality, living in defilement, living in all the dirty things of the world. And they don't think about anything being wrong about that because they are dead, morally dead. And yet, such people, as you come to the Lord today, is able to quicken the dead. And they will quicken the dead in Jesus' name. There are people who are saved before. That means they have spiritual resurrection. And then they die again. They have the second, they have died twice, second, not the final second death. You look, you understand when you look at Jude verse 12. Jude verse 12. These are backsliders. These are people that came to life before, but then uh, they went back into sin. Uh, they became dead second time again. In Jude verse 12, these are sports in your feats of charity. When they feast with you, feeding themselves without fear, clouds they are, without water, carried about with winds, and trees whose fruits wither it, without fruit, tell me what follows, twice dead, twice dead. That means they were dead, forced, in sins and trespasses, they were quickened, they were raised, they were saved. They were born again. They were entangled again with their fears of this life. And so they become twice dead, plucked up by the roots. But thank God, the Father quickens the dead. He'll quicken you today. Make you alive today. A new life will come once again into your life in Jesus' name. There are people who are dead like the prodigal, profligate son. Prodigal son, profligate son. I'm reading from Luke chapter 15. Luke chapter 15. And we're reading from verse 24. Luke chapter 15. We're reading from verse 24. Luke chapter 15, verse 24. For this my son, the prodigal son. For this my son 
the profligate son. For this, my son, the profane son. For this, my son, the one that went away to the far country and spent everything that he had in Rathos living. For this, my son, was dead and is alive again. Life will come again. Spiritual life will come again. Resuscitation, restoration, resurrection, spiritually, will come to you again in Jesus' name. For this, my son, was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to be merry. There are people who are dead in service. They are dead in service. And all they render is dead works. Dead works. The works that do not have any value, any life. And they might, uh, you know, go to church. They might be religious. And they might uh, give money to the beggar. Because it's coming from a dead hand, a dead heart, a dead life. And it says they are dead works. I'm looking at James chapter 2. James chapter 2. And I'm reading here from verse 17. James chapter 2. We're reading from verse 17. Even so, faith, if it had not works, is dead being alone. Those people say, I believe. I believe. I believe. You cannot see transformation. You cannot see a new life. You cannot see a change of life. You cannot see they are not new creatures in Christ. The old life is still there. Old lying is still there. Old wife Beating is still there. Old husband nagging is still there. Old covetousness is still there. Old fraud is still there. Old internet scam or whatever is still there. And yet they say, I believe, I believe that is dead. Even so, faith, if it be without corresponding action, is dead. Look at verse 20. It says in verse 20, but will thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is, tell me, look at verse 26, for as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. Those are the people that Christ, they are Christians in name, but not in nature. The Christians in name, name of a denomination, but they don't have the change of life. I'm looking at Revelation chapter 3 and verse 1. Revelation chapter 3 verse 1. And unto the angel of the church in Sardis write, These things saith he that has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know thy works, that thou hast a name, that thou livest, and are dead. As a name that thou livest and art dead. Those are the people they claim to be religious but they are not righteous. They claim to be alive but they are dead. And they are not conscious of the way of God, of the demands of God, of the commandments of God, and they're not new creatures in Christ. We're coming to another one now. Uh, there are some people that they are alive physically, but some parts of their body are dead. Look at this. I'll show you in Romans chapter 7. Sorry, Romans chapter 4. Romans chapter 4, and I'm reading from verse 19. Romans chapter 4, we're reading from verse 19. I'm waiting for you to open your Bible. Romans chapter, tell me. What's the verse? Verse 19. And being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body, tell me, now dead. He was still alive. That's Abraham. But his body now dead. Because the body wasn't functioning anymore like it was functioning when he was younger. When he was about 100 years old, neither yet, tell me, the deadness of Sarah's womb. The womb also was dead. And so there are people that may be alive, but they have what, some parts of their body dead. Like dead womb, like dead nerves, like dead senses. Like a dead voice, that man is a Christian. His voice is dead. He cannot talk. He cannot witness. He cannot win souls. He cannot talk to anybody. He says he's alive, but his voice is dead. Dead understanding. They read the word, there's no understanding. Dead passion, dead zeal. 
The zeal is gone. The passion is gone. Dead works, dead service. You know, sometimes somebody is talking. He said, it was at the dead hour of the night. What does that mean? Everything was still. Everything was silent. Nobody could do anything. Dead hour of the night. Some people are dead hours in their lives. Dead days in their lives. Dead life. The life is not producing anything anymore. There's something we'll call dead wood. Dead branch. That tree is there, but that branch, although it's standing there, is dead. It's not sucking life out of the stem. And there are people like that. You know, electricians talk about dead wire. And they say, look, I test this. No current is passing through. It's dead wire. And there are some people like that. There's no there's no connection between them and the congregation. There's no connection between them and the Almighty God. It's just dead wire and there's no life passing through it. Dead life. But tonight, whatever is dead in your life, in your mind, in your brain, in your senses, in your passion, in your zeal, in your relationship with God, in your service, He quickens the dead. He'll raise you up. You'll come alive. Where that fire has gone down, fire will come back. Yeah. Zeal will come back. Yeah. The power will come back in Jesus' name. You know, somebody is in that community and then the voice is dead. Nobody can hear him talking about Christ. He's always quiet. He's just walking like this. And he say, man, can't you talk? No, his voice is dead. Your voice will come back. Yeah. Then you'll be able to go out. Anybody you see. And when they see and then you open your mouth, they said something happened. I said something happened. You know, something like a dead wire. You connect them with the globe. The globe is there. There's no light. And they say, why? And then they test. They said, it's dead wire. You connect with people. No light in their lives. You and your husband, you say you are born again. Your husband is not born again. And you are connected. No light. Husband, you say you are born again. You are connected to what? No light. No understanding. It's just dead wire. Current will come today. Power will come today. Because the father quickness the dead. And then the son of God. Jesus Christ. Our redeemer. He quickens the dead. He quickening power is coming upon your life in Jesus. We're coming to chapter 5. I'm coming to point number 3 now. The resurrection of saints and sinners in the future. The resurrection of saints and sinners in the future. I'm reading from John chapter 5 verse 25. Very, very, very soon to you. The hour is coming. And now is. When the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God, and they that hear shall live. Give me a good amen. amen. For the Father's life in himself, so hath he given the Son to have life in himself. And has given him authority to, to execute judgment also. Because he is the son of man. Look at verse 28. Marvel not, marvel not. Don't be surprised at this. Marvel not that I say uh, at this. For the hour is coming. In the which all that are dead in the graves shall hear his voice. And shall come forth. They that have done good unto the resurrection of life. And they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation you see there there's resurrection for saints there's resurrection for sinners and this is talking about the future look at the first part there resurrection of life resurrection unto life we're coming to daniel chapter 12 daniel chapter 12 i'm reading from verse 2 and from verse 3 and many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, the righteous, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. And they that be wise, that's me. And they that be wise, who is that? And they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament. And they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. 
Those are the people that are wise and those are the people that are just and those are the people that are doing good. They're serving the Lord. They're following after the Lord and they're turning many to righteousness. Every walk of their hand, every speech of their mouth, every opportunity they have, they're turning people to righteousness. There'll be the resurrection of the just and they'll be partakers of that. Acts of the Apostles chapter 24. I'm reading from verse 15. Acts chapter 24 reading from verse 15 and have hope toward God which they themselves also allow that there shall be a resurrection of the dead look at the first part both of the just, the righteous those who are saved those who are justified those who are saints and then of the unjust those are the sinners I pray that you'll take part in the resurrection of the just Philippians, Philippians chapter 3, reading from verse 7. Philippians chapter 3, verse 7. But what things were gained unto me? Those I counted laws for Christ. Yea, doubtless, I count all things but laws for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things. And don't count them but dog, that I may win Christ and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of, of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering and being made conformable unto his death. If by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. When the dead shall rise and when the saints shall rise, thank God you'll be there. Amen. First Thessalonians chapter 4. I'm reading from verse 14. First Thessalonians chapter 4 from verse 14. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the watch of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not proceed, proceed prevent or hinder them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and the, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. That's the resurrection of the just. And then we, thank God I'm part of this. I say thank God I'm part of this. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we. And so shall we. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Let's come back to John chapter 5. John chapter 5. And I'm reading here in verse 29. John chapter 5. We're reading from verse 29. I shall come forth. And they that have done good unto the resurrection of life. That's what you're talking about. And they that have done evil unto the resurrection of, tell me, damnation. Damnation. We're coming back to Daniel chapter 12. This resurrection, there is the resurrection of life for the believer, for the saved, for the sanctified, for the righteous, for the pure and holy. But for those who are sinful, those who die in sin, those who die in their degradation, it will be judgment and it will be damnation. In Daniel chapter 12, verse 2, and many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake. Some to everlasting life, look at the rest, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. We're looking at Matthew chapter 23. Matthew chapter 23. I read from verse 25. Matthew chapter 23. Reading from verse 25. It says in verse 25, we want to use scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, 
For ye may clean the outside of the cup and of the platter, but within they are full of extortion and excess. The blind Pharisee cleanse first that which is within the cup and the platter, that the outside of them may be clean also. Warn to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye are like the whitest sepulchres, which indeed appear beautiful outside, but are within full of dead men's bones and full of all uncleanness. Even so, ye also appear righteous unto men outwardly. The people, they only take care of the outside, the outward appearance. I don't wear this, I don't wear that. I don't drink this, I don't, I don't uh, eat that. And because of that, they think they're all right. But there's no conversion. There's no salvation. There's no new life. They have not turned their lives totally unto the Lord. And there is no regenerating power in them that makes them righteous. Look at verse 28. Even so, ye also outwardly appear righteous unto men. But within, ye are full of hypocrisy and iniquity. Look at verse 33. Ye serpents, ye generation of vipers. How can ye escape the damnation of hell? How can ye escape the damnation of hell? Those who continue in sin, they live in sin. There's no repentance, there's no righteousness, there's no regeneration, there's no salvation. They will not escape. Look at chapter 3 of Romans. Romans chapter 3 verse 8. Romans chapter 3, we're looking at verse 8. And not rather... As we be slanderously reported, and as some affirm that we say, let us do evil that good may come. There are some people that say, we know what we are doing is evil, but we have a good intention. Let us do evil that good may come. Because if we don't do that evil, that man will not turn. That man will not change. Our goal is good. Our intention is good. Our aspiration is good. We're doing this is evil, but we want good to be the result. And it says such people, their damnation is just. The will be damnation. I'm looking at First Timothy chapter five, verse twelve. First Timothy chapter five, and we're reading from verse twelve. First Timothy chapter five, verse twelve talks about damnation. Damnation. It's talking about the people that are forsaking the faith, are forsaking the Lord. It's saying having damnation because they have cast off. Their first faith. Those who backslide. Those who turn away from the Lord. Those who are following the Lord before. In the time of trial. Time of temptation. Time of pressure. Time of opposition. Time of persecution. They turn away from the faith. It says they will have damnation. And if they die in sin. And they die in rebellion. And they die in their pollution. When they resurrect. They are going to have the resurrection of the damnation. We are coming to second Peter chapter 3, Second Peter chapter 2 rather, Second Peter chapter 2, Second Peter chapter 2 verse 1. It says, but there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false, false teachers among you, who privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, they were bought before they were redeemed before, they were saved before, they were children of God before, but now they deny the Lord that bought them. It goes on to say, and bring upon themselves swift destruction, and many shall follow their pernicious ways by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. Look at verse 3, and through covetousness shall they with vain words make merchandise of you whose judgment now of a long time lingereth not and tell me once again tell me finally the damnation slumbereth not. There's damnation for those who will, for, for, who will not follow the truth. But there's life eternal. There's justification. There's salvation. There's redemption for those who love the Lord and those who believe in the Lord and those who say, yes, I honor the Father. 
I honor the son. I accept the father. I accept the son. And I accept the teaching of the word of God. And I'm going to follow Christ and follow the Lord until the end of my life. And I pray that as you choose to follow the Lord, you will not go back in Jesus' name. Let's come back. Let's come back to John chapter 5. I'm reading verse 17. John chapter 5 verse 17. It says, Jesus answered them, My father walketh hitherto, and I walk. Christ is at work today. The work of salvation. He will regenerate. He will save. He will have mercy. He's still at work today. He heals today. He delivers today. He sets free today. And whatever the Father can do, because all things are possible unto the Heavenly Father, He says, My Father walketh and I walk. He'll walk in your heart. He'll walk in your life. He'll walk in your home. He'll walk on your personality. If you allow him to open your heart to him today and say, yes, Lord, I believe. Yes, Lord, I accept. My father walketh hitherto and I walk. Can he walk in you tonight? I say, can you walk on your heart tonight? Can you turn your life around tonight? Why don't you rise up and tell the Lord, my father walketh hitherto and I walk. My father walketh hitherto and I walk. My father walketh hitherto and I walk. Open your heart to the Lord and let him walk. Open your life to the Lord and let him walk. Open up to the Lord and say, Lord, here I am. Lord, here I am. My father walketh hitherto and I walk. He can save you. He can redeem you. He can change your life. He can transform your life. He walks. He walks. He's still walking today. If you're dead in sins and trespasses, he's able to give you life. He will quicken you. He will raise you up. Let him walk. 